Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Happy New Year and welcome back to So To Speak the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I'm your host, Nico Perino, and on today's episode, we tie up a theme that we've explored quite extensively over the past year. That theme, of course, is the origin story behind our modern First Amendment. As listeners to this podcast know well by now, the First Amendment wasn't always interpreted by the courts to protect as much speech as it does today. You'll recall that two weeks ago we spoke with Judd Campbell. He's a law professor at the University of Richmond, and he recently wrote an article that argued that the natural rights origins of the First Amendment resulted in protections for speech that were expansive in scope, but weak in their legal effect. We've also in the past chatted with National Constitution Center President Jeffrey Rosen. We spoke with him about former Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis and about the valiant stands Justice Brandeis made for free expression in the 1920s amidst an unsympathetic majority on the Supreme Court. We've spoken with University of Chicago Professor Jeffrey Stone about how the Comstock Act of 1873 restricted sexual expression throughout the country. And we've spoken with Professor Stephen Solomon about the ways that our founders expressed themselves, often under threat of punishment from the British Crown and later their own hard-fought-for United States of America. And finally, we spoke twice in recent months with University of Washington School of Law scholar Ronald Collins. We spoke with him about the effects that World War I and the Espionage Act of 1917 had on free expression in the early part of the 20th century. You'll recall that last year was the 100th anniversary of the Espionage Act and the 100th anniversary of the now largely forgotten decision by Judge Learned Hand in the case Masses v. Patton, which was one of the first free speech cases to challenge the constitutionality of the Espionage Act. In the course of some of these conversations, as you might recall, my guests and I have tipped our hats to one dissenting opinion by one Supreme Court justice in one 1919 Supreme Court case that perhaps more than anything else helped usher in our new era of free speech protections. That justice, of course, was Oliver Wendell Holmes, and the dissent came in the case Abrams versus United States. Today, we are going to finally dig in to Abrams versus United States and the intriguing story behind the man who wrote its dissent. And to help us along the way is Seton Hall law professor Thomas Healy, who is the author of the book, The Great Dissent, How Oliver Wendell Holmes Changed His Mind and Changed the History of Free Speech in America. Professor Healy is a man I've been wanting to speak with for almost a year and a half now since I started this podcast. A little bit of his background prior to his becoming a professor. He clerked for the Ninth Circuit, worked at a law firm, and for many years was a newspaper reporter, including a stint at the Baltimore Sun where he was the Supreme Court correspondent. His book, The Great Descent, which came out in 2013, won many awards, including the Hugh M. Hefner First Amendment Award. It was also selected as a New York Times book review editor's choice, and it's no wonder The Great Descent is not a boring history. Professor Healy's background as a journalist shines through as he manages to bring the story of Oliver Wendell Holmes' free speech transformation alive in vivid detail. I spoke with Professor Healy last week in his offices at Columbia Law School. I should say his office. He just has one of them at his office at Columbia Law School, where he is finishing up a visiting fellowship at the school. And with my throat properly cleared now, I present to you Professor Thomas Healy. Professor Healy, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. So your story is about the birth of the modern First Amendment. In yeah. many ways. And to understand that birth, we need to understand not only the conception of the First Amendment, but also its early years, which were quite different uh, than what started to come as of 1919. What was the state of the First Amendment prior to 1919? 
Well, as I describe it in the book, it was largely an unfulfilled promise. Of course, the First Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights, which was ratified in 1791, and the language is, you know, seemingly pretty straightforward. Congress shall make no law uh, abridging the freedom of speech. But for 130 or more years, uh, the courts didn't take that command very seriously. Obviously, the, the first big test of free speech in this country was the Alien and Sedition Act of 1798, uh, in which the Federalists uh, essentially made it a crime to criticize uh, the president uh, or other high-ranking members of the Federalist Party. And put in jail their critics. A dozen or more uh, of their critics, mostly newspaper editors, uh, were jailed and fined for, you know, essentially engaging in pretty generic political debate um, uh, and scrutiny of government officials. The courts upheld the Sedition Act of 1798. Uh, It never got to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court justices at the time, they often rode circuit, and a number of the justices heard cases brought under the Sedition Act and raised no questions about its constitutionality. Um, James Madison did. Um, He he argued that it was unconstitutional. And when uh, when Jefferson became president um, in 1800, uh, the the Sedition Act uh, expired. Uh, Jefferson um, pardoned those who had been convicted. And Congress later uh, repaid some of the fines. Um, But that was a pretty rough way to get Mm -hmm. started uh, in terms of uh, trying to determine what uh, the First Amendment meant. And over the next century or more, the, the courts were pretty insensitive to claims of free speech. So lower courts um, upheld all sorts of restrictions on speech, uh, the censorship of books and movies, prohibition. The Comstock Act in the Com- 1870s. Absolutely. The, the Comstock Act was upheld by the courts. Uh, you know, the courts upheld prohibitions of street corner speeches and labor protests. Um, and the Supreme Court... Uh, never once uh, throughout the 19th century or early 20th century um, upheld a claim uh, brought under the First Amendment, which is pretty remarkable if you think about Mm -hmm. it. And so this modern birth of the First Amendment came about in large part during wartime. This is World War I, and through one man inspired by many other men, uh, your, your story is one of many different characters, but the the principal character is Oliver Wendell Holmes, who sits on the Supreme Court at the time. He'd sit on the, sat on the Supreme Court for many years, and he's sort of an odd person to usher in this change because he's a man, as you describe in your book, who disdained all constitutional rights, who was an advocate of judicial restraint, famously saying, if my fellow citizens wanted to go to hell, I will help them. <laughs> Uh, and he really had no qualms about the entry into the European conflict, as you write, and the efforts made by the government to ensure victory during that conflict at all costs. He said, damn a man who ain't for his country right or wrong. Uh, you say that summed up his views mm-hmm. on the matter. And and most importantly, I guess, for sort of understanding how dramatic this shift is, he was the author of the opinion in Patterson v. Colorado in 1907, which codified this Blackstonian view of free speech, uh, codified, in a certain sense, the bad tendency test, and uh, really curtailed any sense that the First Amendment might be something larger uh, than that. Can you talk about that period of Holmes's life and his thinking about the First Amendment? Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's important to recognize that his thinking about free speech really just fits into his larger view about the role of courts uh, and about the uh, the function of democracy. And uh, as you as you uh, uh, put it, uh, you know, Holmes thought that democratic majorities should be able to do what they wanted, um, and that judges shouldn't get in the way. He believed in judicial restraint, and this was actually something that he had applied 
in many contexts, not just in uh, government restrictions of speech, uh, but in uh, government efforts to um, uh, to enforce uh, progressive labor laws. So, you know, his most famous dissent up to this point was in Lochner, right? Was the Lochner dissent um, in which. Uh, you know, the majority of the court had struck down a New York law that limited the number of hours that bakers could work in a day or in a week. And Holmes dissented, arguing that uh, the court had no business <clears throat> second guessing the judgment that the New York legislature had made. Um, and progressives hailed Holmes for that. I mean, one of the uh, important things to remember about this time period is that it was a time in which uh, conservative judges uh, or justices on the court um, were engaged in uh, judicial activism. Uh, in other words, interpreting the Constitution very broadly to invalidate laws passed by the by the legislature, by the democratically elected branches of government. And it was progressives and liberals who were advocating judicial restraint, mm -hmm. um, who, who thought that you shouldn't stretch the language of the Constitution in order to protect some right. And so uh, Holmes's thinking about free speech really just um, derived from his larger views about the prerogatives of a democratic majority and about the limited role of courts in enforcing constitutional rights. And, and he really didn't see any difference uh, between those two uh, types of government re regulations. And just as he thought that the government should be free to regulate the economy and the workplace, he thought government should generally be free to, to regulate what people say, uh, what kind of uh, expression they engage in. Um, so, so that's really where those views came from. And as you, as you said, you know, he, he had done as much as any judge to limit the right of free speech through the Patterson decision, embracing the Blackstonian uh, view of free speech, which is incredibly limited. Mm -hmm. you know, the Blackstonian view says that uh, the freedom of speech only prohibits the government from imposing pre-publication censorship. Prior restraints. Prior restraints. Uh, but that once people speak, the government is free to punish them for whatever they say. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to us, that seems ludicrous. What good is freedom of speech if after you speak, the government can punish you for whatever yeah. it is that you said? But there's a long, long history uh, in support of that view. I mean, that's famously what John Milton advocated for in Areopagitica and, and presumably uh, what most Americans believe the First Amendment meant up until the 1910s, so to speak. But Holmes is transformation began uh, kind of by a chance meeting on a train ride up to Beverly Farms, uh, which is where he spent his summers in Massachusetts. He met a man, a uh, justice uh, at the Southern District of New York, uh, Justice Learned Hand, who had recently written a decision in the case of Masses v. Patton uh, involving a magazine, Masses, which published some articles and poems and cartoons critical of World War I and was sub subsequently restricted from distributing those magazines through the, the Postal Service. Uh, and they filed a lawsuit and, and won in the district court but lost on appeal. And, and Justice Learned Hand's opinion at the district court in support of Masses magazine was really – you know, is the way our, our friend Ron Collins puts it, the first shot about the bow against this old sort of First Amendment mm -hmm. interpretation. What did Learned Hand say to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes on that train, and how did uh, Justice Holmes respond? Well, Hand was, um, Hand was rather upset at this point. This was uh, the summer of 1918, and it was a year earlier that he had uh, written his opinion in the Masses case in which he ruled for the magazine and had interpreted the uh, the Espionage Act of 1917 narrowly. Um, the Espionage Act, of course, made it a crime to, to, to publish false reports uh, about the war or to say anything that might uh, obstruct the draft or lower morale in the, uh, in the uh, armed forces. Um, and Han's opinion in that case, in the Masses case, uh, had been overturned by the Second Circuit. Um, and so he was upset. And he was also upset because he saw the way the 
Espionage Act was being enforced. Um, it was being enforced quite aggressively across the country. Um, over the course of the war, there were uh, more than 2,000 indictments brought under both the Espionage Act of 1917 and its um, uh, the follow-up law, the Sedition Act of 1918. Um, and people were being put in jail for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, um, sometimes for really tame uh, comments about the war or about the draft. Um, and Han was really uh, distressed by what he saw. And so he, he ran into Holmes on the train between New York and Boston. And Holmes and Han knew each other. <clears throat> in fact, Han really worshipped Holmes <clears throat> in part because of Holmes's um, uh, gospel of judicial restraint. And so Han was looking for a sympathetic ear. Um, and he sort of was venting to Holmes about uh, the hysteria that was sweeping the country. Um, and Holmes's response, uh, as later recorded by Hand, um, was that Hand struck at the sacred right to kill the other fellow when he disagrees. Mm -hmm. By which I think Holmes meant that, you know, when we disagree strongly enough, we kill each other. Um, that's what war is. Uh, Holmes had fought in the Civil War. Uh, he had been wounded three times. Uh, so he knew very well that sort of the, the logical endpoint of disagreement was to, was to kill um, the other person. Uh, and so that's why he said what he said to Hand. Um, and Hand was sort of taken aback by this. Uh, and according to a letter Hand wrote afterwards, he was sort of shocked into silence. And so the two men separated, uh, went their separate ways, and Hand kept thinking about it. And a, a couple of days later, he wrote Holmes a follow-up letter. And it's in this follow-up letter where he really um, makes the case for free speech. Um, and what he says is that tolerance uh, is the twin of incredulity. Uh, by incredulity, he means doubt or uncertainty about our own views, about whether we know the truth. So what he's essentially doing is he's appealing to Holmes's skepticism. Uh, he knew that Holmes didn't believe in any sort of natural universal rights. So instead, uh, he appeals to uh, Holmes's uh, skepticism and thinks that if he explains that when we're uncertain of whether we know the truth, then we should let other people speak, that that will bring Holmes around to his way of thinking. But, but Holmes' initial response to that is, yeah, we might be uncertain on how to act, but act we must. Absolutely. And, and therefore, we can't be sort of restrained by this uncertainty. Otherwise, nothing would ever get done. And that's, I believe Holmes responded in a letter to him in, in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And he, he, he makes a comparison between the freedom of speech and freedom from vaccination. You know, people might argue they have a right not to be vaccinated, just like they might argue they have a right to free speech. Mm -hmm. um, but the court uh, had upheld um, the ability of the government to forcibly vaccinate individuals. Um, and Holmes thought that there was really no difference, that if... Mm -hmm. You know, if the government felt strongly enough about it, um, it could force people to get vaccinated just like it could restrict them um, from criticizing uh, the war or the draft. Um, and you're right. He, he thought uh, that even though we're, uh, we can't know the tr truth for sure, we have to act. He says that is the condition of every act. Mm -hmm. You know, we're always acting in the face of uncertainty, but, uh, but we have to act and um, that holds true whether we're talking about, you know, vaccination or freedom of speech. Yeah. So after this meeting with Hand, Holmes gets sort of the full court press from his friends and from those he actually admires in the broader progressive community to change his mind about the freedom of speech. Uh, there's a cast of characters in here, and I'd urge all of our listeners to read your book and learn more about these cast of characters. They include Harold Lasky, who was a progressive activist, a young friend of Holmes, someone Holmes actually considered to be a son of sorts. Holmes didn't have any children. He was a lecturer at Harvard, and, and interestingly, he was the future chairman of the Labor Party in uh, Great Britain, uh, the party that in 1945 unseated uh, Winston Churchill, uh, yes. he presided over that over that party, and he seems to be the one who was primarily responsible for changing 
Holmes's mind. He's the one who gave Holmes many of the books on toleration. Um, at the time, freedom of speech wasn't always called the freedom of speech or the marketplace of ideas. Uh, Holmes would later introduce that phrase, but it was often called uh, toleration, the idea of tolerating those with whom you disagree. Tell us a little bit about Harold Lasky and what he meant to Holmes during this period. Lasky was a really fascinating, uh, colorful character. He was um, 23, 24 years old at this time, and was a lecturer in uh, political theory at Harvard. He had very sort of radical views. Um, I, I describe him as being just to the right of Marx. Um, <laughs> And and it's, uh, it's it's very interesting that he and Holmes became so close, given how different uh, their views were. But Lasky was brilliant by all accounts and had a sort of infectious personality. And he also had a talent for cultivating friendships with people who were older than him and who were well established. And he really. Uh, sort of took it upon himself to ingratiate himself to Holmes. He was introduced to Holmes by Felix Frankfurter, who was then a young uh, professor at Harvard Law School. and Future and, Supreme Court Justice. Yes, and, um, and Lasky and Frankfurter were friends, and Frankfurter knew Holmes and had um, been invited to Holmes' house in Beverly Farms, uh, and he invited Lasky uh, to come uh, with him. And... Lasky apparently left a hairbrush or something and had to write to Holmes about it. And then they sort of struck up this tremendous correspondence where they were just writing each other, you know, on a really frequent basis uh, and pretty soon became sort of very affectionate with one another. And so, yes, uh, Lasky became really the son that Holmes never had. And Holmes often referred to him as my boy. And he referred to uh, Lasky and Frankfurter and other young progressives as the young lads. Mm -hmm. And Lasky really, uh, he knew everyone and he had his hand in everything. Uh, he contributed to the New Republic. You know, he was uh, very active in labor organizing and he fed Holmes all sorts of books. Yeah, one um, of the books I have written down here that he fed him was The Theory of Toleration Under the Later, Later Stuarts. So, <laughs> some of these obscure books, and I love reading your your book because it talks about all these obscure books that Holmes liked to read on his summer vacation in Beverly Farms. Oh, he would read, you know, 40 or 50 incredibly dense tomes, uh, you know, on uh, political theory or art or um, or history. Although uh, one, in one summer, much to his chagrin, he read a, a book on textiles, right? <laughs> yeah, he was, he, Lasky and, uh, and some of the other progressives, you know, they were constantly trying to make Holmes more sensitive to the plight of the working man. And, you know, Holmes was generally pretty conservative. He came from an old Boston family. He was a member of the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the broad in class, and he really had very little sympathy uh, for uh, the working class. He called them uh, the thick-fingered clowns. So it's very strange that these progressives looked up to him so, but they were constantly, you know, trying to um, trying to move him to the left on on these various uh, issues. Yeah, and on, in particular on the free speech issue, did Lasky learn about? Holmes's conversation with Hand, and is that what sparked the subsequent press to get Holmes to come around on the free speech issue? Well, he did learn about Holmes's conversation with Hand on the train and the subsequent letters because um, Lasky was spending the summer of 1918 up the coast from Beverly Farms in Rockport, Massachusetts. And when Holmes arrived at Beverly Farms, he wrote to Lasky and they arranged to meet. And then Holmes shared uh, his conversation with Hand and, and the subsequent letters with Hand uh, with Lasky. And then he and Lasky exchanged letters mm -hmm. on this issue. And then Lasky begins to feed Holmes a series of books on toleration and political liberalism. So, you know, as I see it, this behind-the-scenes campaign to change Holmes's mind, it really does uh, begin in earnest with this meeting on the train, this chance encounter between Hand and Holmes, which is followed up by similar exchanges between Holmes and Lasky. One of the things that I'm struck by in your book uh, is the letter writing in the early 20th century. It's 
the way they spoke with each other and communicated with each other is so different than how we do today uh, because even in moments of disagreement, they go exceptionally far in trying not to be disagreeable. So when Lasky's pressing Holmes on these questions and, and Hand is pressing Holmes on these questions, you can get the sense that Holmes wants to dismiss him, that Holmes really rejects these ideas, but he does it in a way where he sort of says, I think we're in agreement, but maybe where we're not in agreement, you don't see it this way because you missed this point and it's not your fault that you missed this point. It, it, these letters are just fascinating, but they don't seem to have any effect on Holmes. Well, it, it's hard to know. I mean, you know, I, I think... At least um, initially. Yeah, right, at least initially. I mean, I think over time, you know, they start to move Holmes's views on free speech, but you're right. I mean, uh, in the beginning of 1919, in January of 1919, the Supreme Court hears the first of a group of cases um, involving convictions under the Espionage and Sedition Acts, and Holmes is assigned to write the uh, opinions for a unanimous court in, in these three early cases, um, one of which involved Eugene Debs, mm -hmm. who was the leader of the Socialist Party, who at that point had run for president four times, getting 6% of the popular vote, I believe, in 1912. So a really you know, major political figure um, who had been convicted for a stump speech he gave in Canton, Ohio, in the summer of 1918. And Holmes writes the opinions in these cases, and he upholds the convictions under the Espionage and Sedition Acts in all three of these cases, and is rather dismissive of the free speech claims that are raised, giving us the famous example of shouting fire in a crowded theater to explain why the First Amendment is not absolute. And that was in Schenck v. United States, which was decided on March 3rd of 1919. This is about eight months or so after his meeting with Learned Hand. And one of the interesting historical notes that I found in your book was that Holmes really wasn't the inventor of the shouting fire in a crowded theater trope. Uh, it was originally the the prosecutor, it seems, at, I believe, the trial court. In the Debs case, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he, when you go back and you read that trial transcript, he's the one who, um, who makes the argument that free speech is an absolute because, of course, you wouldn't protect somebody who falsely shouted fire in a crowded theater. Now, his elaboration of it was was far less eloquent. Yeah, I have um, it here. He said, a man in a crowded auditorium or any theater who yells fire and there is no fire and a panic ensues and someone is trampled to death may be rightly indicted and charged with murder. Right. Yeah, much so, less uh, eloquent. <laughs> not, as, not as catchy as Holmes's mm -hmm. version. Um, but yeah, Holmes uh, always read the uh, the transcript of record. Um, in the cases uh, that he was um, writing opinions for. And so, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that that's where he, he got that example. Mm -hmm. But he's generally pretty dismissive of the free speech claims that are made um, uh, in these cases, which does suggest that these early efforts by Hand and Lasky and some other individuals to, to change his views have not been fully successful as of the beginning of 1919. Yeah, but the seed seems to be planted in at least one of these decisions. So there's three decisions. There's Shank v. United States, which was written on March 3rd, or decided on March 3rd, and there's Frowork v. United States, March 10th, and then Debs, which was also March 10th, and he wrote the majority opinions for all three cases. But it seems the free speech advocates, people like Lasky, uh, and in particular people like Zachariah Chafee, who's a Harvard law professor who also has occasion to meet Holmes later, find in his Shank opinion this phrase, a clear and present danger. Holmes wrote in Shank, the question in every case is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. It is a question of proximity and degree. This is different than the bad tendency doctrine that existed prior to that. And it is different than this resting upon the Blackstonian view of prior restraints. And Holmes, in the decision, even tips his hat to this in saying it well may be that the prohibition of laws abridging the freedom of speech is not confined to previous restraints, although to prevent them may have been the main purpose as intimated in Patterson v. Colorado. So we're starting to see a change here, even though Holmes, as you write in the book, may not be aware that he's doing it because 
clear and present danger isn't present in the Frowork decision, nor is it present in the Debs decision. But Zachariah Chafee sees this and in this classic <laughs> like Victorian letter-writing way says, Holmes, you must have meant this as a change. Holmes didn't agree with that because he was reluctant to disagree that he ever changed his mind. Sure. Um, later, when after he'd written Abrams and Zachariah Chafee had asked him about his earlier decisions, he just said he was ignorant, not that he was wrong. So how significant was Schenck? Uh, well, I think you're right, um, that the seeds are being planted here. And and I, I view Holmes's you know, transformation on the issue of free speech as a um, a somewhat gradual over the course of a year and a half, say from, you know, the middle of 1918 to the end of 1919, you know, sort of maybe two steps forward, one step back, because it is true that although he um, dismisses the free speech claims that are made in Shank and Frowork and Debs, he first, he uh, he abandons the Blackstonian view mm-hmm. um, in a sort of very casual, offhanded way, as though it's it's not that big a deal, as though Patterson had only suggested that the Blackstonian view was embraced by the First Amendment. But that by itself is a huge step in you know the history of free speech in this country to go from a regime in which the government is only prohibited from imposing prior restraints to a regime in which the First Amendment governs regulations after the fact, or restrictions mm-hmm. on speech after the fact, that's huge by itself. And it gets somewhat overshadowed because in that same opinion, Holmes introduces this language of clear and present danger, which sounds quite different from bad tendency. Bad tendency means that if the speech has any tendency to cause any harm at any time, the government can punish it. Clear and present danger, at least on its face, suggests that the government can only punish speech when the danger is clear, which I would take to mean, you know, likely, very likely, Mm -hmm. um, and when the danger is present, meaning near, going to imminent, going to happen soon. If Holmes had applied the clear and present danger test in Shank, I think, first of all, he would have had to reverse the convictions. Uh, I think he would have had to reverse the convictions in Frowork and Debs. Mm -hmm. Um, And these cases, these early cases, would be the cases that we look to as the sort of beginning of the the modern era of free speech in this country rather than the Abrams case at the end of the year. But he doesn't do that. Clear and present danger is a phrase that he seems to throw out there kind of casually. Um, It comes as best... I can tell, and other people can tell, it comes from his thinking about the law of attempt. You know, when uh, somebody attempts a crime, the question is, how close do they have to get to the commission of the crime for it to be punishable? And Holmes thought they had to get pretty close. And he had used that that phrase, it's a question of proximity and degree, Mm -hmm. in the context of the law of attempt. And so I think he essentially borrowed these ideas in order to articulate a standard in this case, but then he doesn't actually apply the standard. He just sort of says, well, you know, the government has a right to to punish the speech. Mm -hmm. And so these cases, I think, sort of become a way station, you know, on the way to the ultimate destination, which is reached in the Abrams decision. All three of these cases deal with defendants who were socialists and had spoken out against the war and been charged with inciting disloyalty in the military or obstructing the draft. Um, I don't think any of them actually called for obstruction of the draft, but the argument is that they had, there was this bad tendency. So at this time, you have this concern about people speaking out against the war affecting the war effort. And you also have this concern about the rise of socialism. This is the start of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And I think one of the interesting insights that you have in your book and new insights in, it's a novel theory and it's of particular interest to me because I'm interested in campus issues, is what's happening at Harvard at the time of this full court press on Holmes. Because some of his friends are undergoing attempts by the public to get them fired from the Harvard faculty. I've got here that Lasky was critical of the Boston police. You write that several prominent alumni wrote to the president of Harvard, President Lowell, complaining that Lasky was corrupting the student body with his radical views and barbarian manners. There was even an effort to try and get Felix Frankfurter thrown off of 
the Harvard faculty. You write that there's a trickle of letters to Lowell that turned into a flood, and this was in the midst of a Harvard fundraising campaign. But the president uh, refused to give in to the pressure, as you write, and he said, at least in the case of Frankfurt, or Holmes wrote in to the president defending him. But in the case of Lowell, he refused to give in the pressure. I was struck here that he said if Harvard represented only one point of view, it would be stagnant. And that he said academic freedom is a fundamental principle of the university. I'm struck by how similar these controversies in 1917, 18, and 19 at Harvard are to today's controversies. Mm -hmm. It's like the more things change, the more they remain the same. But that's a long way of me getting to say that Holmes was aware of these free speech controversies, academic freedom controversies at Harvard. And you seem to suggest that this might have influenced his thinking on these issues. It doesn't seem to be a smoking gun that it did, but you say he was a pragmatist and that he there's the world of theory and then there's the world of action. And, and he actually saw what could happen to his friends in an environment where marketplace of ideas is restricted. Yeah, I absolutely think that's what happened. I think, uh, you know, Holmes, um, he, he, he had a very theoretical um, approach to the law, and he didn't care much for facts. And I think issues of free speech to him were largely abstract uh, when you know the defendants were some socialists he didn't know or, or Eugene Debs. But when he saw uh, people that he um, admired uh, and was uh, quite close to, when he saw them come under attack for their views, um, I think that made him more sensitive uh, to um, to the the dangers of uh, suppression. Um, and I think that you know the um, the face of free speech, instead of being Eugene Debs, it became Harold Lasky, someone that mm-hmm. that Holmes viewed um, almost as a son. Uh, and and I do think that that is a part of Holmes's transformation. I think that you know there's a sort of intellectual uh, cognitive aspect to it. You know, he's he's doing a lot of reading. He's um, he's he's engaging in debates with Lasky and and Zachariah Chafee and others about the issue of free speech. Um, so I think there's that element of his conversion. Uh, but then I think there's the you know the emotional or the personal element. And I think that you know the issue of free speech became very personal to him. And uh, Lasky and and uh, Frankfurter had both reached out to Holmes for help in the the Harvard difficulties situation. they yeah. were having at Harvard. And Holmes had responded earlier in the year by writing to the Harvard Law School Alumni Association mm-hmm. and to President Lowell. And then in in the fall of 1919, uh, things got even worse because um, you say Lasky criticized the Boston police. What he did was he he stood up for the police who were striking. Um, he basically supported the right a poli- to unionize. Yeah, he supported a That's police right. strike. You know, which is a, a pretty radical concept. Not even the liberals at the New Republic were willing to support mm-hmm. a police strike because when the police strike, you know, that's sort of the end of sort of the end of order, peace and order. But Lasky did uh, did support the police who were striking. Um, and for that, he came under intense criticism by the Boston media. And uh, lots of wealthy Harvard donors told the president of Harvard that they would not take part in this fundraising campaign unless Lasky were essentially gotten rid of. Yeah, I wanna, you write that some of the letters talked about how it would be one thing if he taught mathematics or physics, but Lasky taught history and government, the very subjects a Bolshevist was least suited to teach. <laughs> it is not, Mr. President, asked one writer, like selecting an atheist to teach our boys religion. Uh, you could see some of these letters getting written to college presidents today, and I, in fact, have seen some le- le- very similar letters getting rid- written to college presidents today. And ultimately, the pressure campaign was successful in driving Lasky out of Harvard. Later, he is told by Lowell that he'd never get promoted to a full professor, and he decided to leave the United States and right. go to the London School of Economics. But you also have another interesting historical note here that perhaps – Holmes was reminded of during this controversy, which was 60 years earlier when he was a student editor at the Harvard Magazine, he had her own run-in with the campus authorities. The magazine at the time was publishing a series of provocative articles, as you write, on abolition, atheism, and women in college. And 
You write that Holmes got caught up in the idealism of his own youth, had added his voice to the chorus, and urged readers not to avoid books of an agitating tendency. We must, he wrote, will we or no, have every train of thought brought before us while we are young and may as well at once prepare for it. And in response to not only Holmes's articles, but the other articles the magazine had published, the faculty appointed a committee at Harvard to consider whether the magazine should be shut down. Um, whether Holmes was reminded this in the controversy, I don't know, but it's hard to imagine that he wasn't. But this is all by way of talking about the various influences that were occurring in 1918 and 1919 leading up to the famous changing of his mind. And he originally changed his mind in a much, you know, if it, it ultimately was Balitzar v. United States, which was Holmes's big change uh, decision. Uh, I don't know that it would be as successful as if it was Abrams v. United States. Tell us a little bit about Emanuel Baltzer, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, v. United States. Well, this was a case that was actually, um, came before the court before uh, Schenck, Frowork, and Deb. So this uh, case came to the court oh, that's in right. November of 1918. And it was um, a case involving a group of South Dakota farmers, mostly German immigrants, who were upset about the way the draft was being administered in their state. They thought that more young men from their county were being drafted than from other counties. Um, and so they had written a letter to the governor who under the law was responsible for administering the draft, complaining about this. The letter had only been sent to the governor, only seen by the governor and um, I think one of his aides, um, but they were prosecuted mm -hmm. um, under the Espionage Act. And Holmes, urged on by his fellow justice, Louis Brandeis, um, had written a dissent in that case, um, largely relying upon the uh, right in the First Amendment to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That dissent, however, was never published because the government confessed error in the case before the decision was handed down. Now, there's some mystery as to what happened, and mm -hmm. I speculate in the book uh, that Brandeis tipped the government off that Holmes was writing a dissent that was going to be joined by himself and, and at least one other justice, and, uh, and that the government didn't want that sort of dissent in its first case before the court involving the Espionage Act, so it confessed error and dismissed the case. And Baltzer, again, I think is another sort of step along the way, uh, just as Shank and Frowork and Deb show Holmes making a little bit of progress, I think Baltzer does as well. And yeah, it's interesting to think about what would have happened if the Baltzer decision had actually, you know, been issued and if Holmes's dissent had been published. You know, maybe Shank, Frowork and Debs would have come out differently. Um, maybe the Abrams case wouldn't have been the same. It's hard to know. But because the Baltzer case was dismissed and because it, it didn't come to light for another 75 years when one of Holmes's biographers was digging through his papers, because of all that, you know, Abrams, the case decided in November of 1919 is the case in which Holmes really announces uh, sort of his a new a new view of free speech. Yeah, as you put it in the title, <laughs> he changed his mind and changed the history of free speech in this one dissent that you call the Great Dissent. And Abrams uh, deals with the distribution of leaflets by socialists here in New York City, where we're chatting today. Uh, the story of how they distributed the leaflets is kind of funny. They went to the top of buildings and, I guess, flung them out and onto the, the walking masses beneath them and uh, were ultimately prosecuted under the Espionage Act for doing that. But uh, the court, I, in keeping with its decisions in Debs and Frowork and Shank, um, ruled that this was a constitutional um, abridgment of speech. Uh, I guess you, they wouldn't have put it that way, but Holmes disagreed, and he disagreed in a profound way, rejecting the bad tendency doctrine, um, sort of reasserting his idea of clear and present danger. Talk a little bit about that. Right. So the the majority of the court, um, you know, upheld the convictions of these um, these anarchists who were Russian immigrants who actually did not so much oppose the war against Germany. What they had opposed was... The meddling um, in the Russian Revolution. Absolutely. The Wilson's decision to send 
troops into Russia, which they viewed, uh, these Russian immigrants viewed, as an attempt to put down the Russian Revolution. Uh, so they had called Wilson a coward and a hypocrite, and they had urged workers in the munitions factories, of which there were quite a few in lower Manhattan at the time, uh, they had urged them uh, to go on strike, to not produce arms because they argued that these uh, arms would be used not only to kill Germans, but to kill uh, their their brothers and, and comrades and family members at home in Russia. Um, and a majority of the court upheld the conviction uh, simply citing to Shank for the proposition that the government can suppress speech that threatens the war effort. You know, if you agreed with Schenck, Frowork, and Debs, the conclusion in Abrams was pretty much preordained. Especially and, when the facts in this case are seem to be worse than the facts in the three other cases. Worse for the defendants, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think there's a stronger case for punishing the defendants in the Abrams case than in the earlier cases. And so it's no surprise that you know a majority of the court upholds the convictions, but Holmes dissents. And his dissent is written, um, uh, he says uh, in a letter to Frankfurter um, that he wrote it quasi in furor, which is Latin for as if possessed. Um, so the suggestion here is that, you know, he sort of wrote it in a, in a kind of worked up, passionate state. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that he's writing this at the very moment that Lasky is under pressure at Harvard for his defense of the Boston police strike. Um, and uh, and also some intense criticism in the Harvard Law Review and the New Republic, a progressive magazine that he was a great admirer of. Absolutely. Um, and so Holmes writes this uh, dissent. It's a pretty short opinion. It's 12 paragraphs. And a large portion of the dissent is dealing with questions of statutory interpretation, uh, what sort of intent is required under uh, the um, the Espionage and Sedition Acts. But Holmes also addresses the, the question of uh, the First Amendment. And the first thing that he does, which is hugely important, is he reaffirms the clear and present danger test that he had introduced nine months earlier, but had really sort of left hanging. Um, in Abrams, he makes clear that that is, in his view, the correct test, and that it prohibits the government from punishing speech unless the speech poses an imminent or immediate danger. And he uses those words imminent and immediate over and over again to really drive home the point. And then he goes a step further and he explains, well, he doesn't really explain, he concludes that the leaflets in the Abrams case pose no such danger. Which is which is hard to understand considering his decisions in Debs, Frowork, and Shank. Absolutely. I mean, if you thought that the leaflets in Shank or Deb's speech or the um, the newspaper articles in Frowork, if you thought those posed an imminent danger, uh, then it's hard to draw much distinction between those and the leaflets. It's a complete. It's a complete about face too, because when he took some criticism from his friends for the decision in Deb's, he said, you know, if it was me, I would never have prosecuted this case. But, you know, I was given these facts by the jury and and the jury came to these decisions and there's nothing I could do to overturn it. He didn't do the same such questioning of the jury in Abrams. Right. Uh, So he completely ignores that. He completely ignores his decision in Patterson. He completely even does an about face in his philosophical discussions that he had with Learn and Hand about action. Absolutely. So he had deferred to the jury's findings in the earlier cases, but now he doesn't defer to the jury's findings. And I think the most important thing he does in his Abrams dissent, you know, had he had he simply um, argued that clear and present danger was the correct test and that these defendants pose no clear and present danger. I think it would have been interesting, Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not certain that uh, the dissent would have had the effect on our thinking about free speech that it's had. But what he does after that is he explains philosophically why um, we should believe in freedom of speech. And I have that paragraph in front of me, and I think it's worthwhile to read it. 
He writes that, but when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade and ideas. The best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. And you have this great synopsis of what Holmes does in that very long sentence. You write, these then were the elements of Holmes's argument for tolerance, an acknowledgement based on experience that human judgment is fallible, a recognition, thanks to Mill, that's John Stuart Mill, that free speech is the necessary predicate on which our bets about the universe must be based, and a conviction inherited from Adam Smith about the power of free trade and competition to promote the greater good. Weaving these various threads together, Holmes responded to the logic of persecution in this one sentence. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, all of these discussions that Holmes had had over the past year and a half, all of these books and articles that he had read, all of the thinking that he had done about free speech, it really all comes together in this final paragraph in the Abrams' Descent, um, in which he introduces the idea of the marketplace of ideas. He talks about free trade and ideas, and he finally has an answer now to the objection he raised earlier to Hand, when Hand had said uh, that, you know, that tolerance is the twin of incredulity, that, that when we're uncertain, we should be hesitant to suppress speech, Holmes's response was, we're always uncertain, but that shouldn't stop us from acting. But rereading John Stuart Mill um, over this time period, Holmes finds the answer to that objection. And Mill's answer was that it's true that we have to act in the face of uncertainty, but there's a difference between acting in the face of uncertainty and suppressing speech in the face of uncertainty. Because according to Mill, the fact that we have heard opposing views is the only basis upon which we can have any confidence in the views upon mm -hmm. which we're acting. You know, we're, of course, we're uncertain about whether we know the truth, but at least if we've heard the opposing ideas, we can mm -hmm. think we've done the best we can. Mm -hmm. you know, this, is, this is as far as we can go. Mm -hmm. But if we suppress those ideas, then we have no safeguard whatsoever for taking any other action. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, I think, um, what Holmes comes to believe and what he expresses in this final paragraph of the Abrams dissent. Yeah. It's, it's hard to overstate how influential this one dissent in 1919 was and how before its time it was. I mean, the clear and present danger standard really wouldn't become law until 1969 in Brandenburg v. Ohio. But Louis Brandeis and Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes for years on the court after this initial dissent were joining each other in dissents uh, in free speech cases, we have United States v. Uh, Schwimmer. You have Brandeis's famous dissent in Whitney v. California. But I want to ask you, when we think about the legacy of Abrams, actually, when we think about the legacy of Oliver Wendell Holmes, do you think he did more harm than good for free speech when you consider that many of his opinions limiting speech pre-Abrams sort of codified this old school of thought. And do you think that had Holmes not written Abrams, do you think Brandeis could have done all the good that Holmes had done by himself? Or was Holmes such a powerful figure that it could only have been done by him? Well, to answer your first question. Yeah, there's question, three questions in one. <laughs> to answer your first question, I think Holmes did more good for free speech. Uh, I, th I think he helped it more than he heard it. Um, you know, the views that he expressed pre-Abrams were views that lots of other judges and justices were expressing. Um, it's true that he wrote the opinion in Patterson, but, you know, everybody on the court other than uh, John Harlan joined that opinion. And, and it didn't seem like he gave that opinion much thought. He, I guess he was inspired from a Massachusetts Supreme Court justice. And yeah, you know, I think that was um, that was a pretty common view at the time, mm -hmm. that that the First Amendment codified the Blackstonian view of free speech. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, Holmes was was um, not all that different from other judges in his view of free speech prior to 1919. So I don't think he, he did 
you know, any particular harm to the cause of free speech. And and I think that, you know, his Abrams dissent and the the subsequent dissents um, did a, a, you know, a tremendous uh, amount of good mm-hmm. in our, in terms of our thinking about free speech. I mean, not only does he abandon the Blackstonian view on behalf of the court, uh, he gives us the clear and present danger test. He explains how it should be applied. He and, he and Brandeis explain how it should be applied. They explain why imminence is so important because, um, you know, if the harm is going to happen imminently, then there's no time for counter speech, uh, which introduces an incredibly important concept into our free speech theory, the, the idea of counter speech as a alternative to government censorship. And most importantly, he gives us a theoretical foundation for thinking about free speech. He explains that it's important uh, as a part of the search for truth. The marketplace of ideas. The marketplace of ideas. Um, you know, that's a, a, a a phrase that um, he doesn't actually use that phrase marketplace of ideas, but he uses the phrase the competition the of the market, and and it's you know the the metaphor um, it comes from Holmes, um, and you know he also makes clear that he um, that he thinks that the First Amendment was meant to do away with the crime of seditious libel. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's something that the court will make clear uh, in New York Times versus Sullivan in the 1960s. Um, but Holmes in 1919 is is expressing mm-hmm. that as his view. So I think that the, the good he did far exceeds the harm uh, that he did prior to Abrams. Mm-hmm. As for your second question, is it possible that Brandeis uh, or someone else uh, could have carried the mantle of free speech? Um, it's possible. Um, you know, had Holmes not written this dissent, would Brandeis have dissented in Abrams? Um, we don't know one way or the other. I mean, Brandeis did join his dissent. Yeah, but the note he sent to Holmes was sort of just like three or four words. Right. You know, very good. I, I join or I concur or something. <laughs> you know, Brandeis later said that during this time period, um, he thought at the issue of free speech rather than through it. Um, I think he actually didn't give it that much thought during this uh, during this time period uh, because he was quite um, preoccupied with other issues, including uh, the Zionist movement of which he was uh, uh, the leader in America. Mm-hmm. Later, he does, um, you know, he writes this beautiful opinion in Whitney, um, and he is quite eloquent. Um, would he have come up with clear and present danger? Would he have um, written quite so eloquently and confidently um, without... Holmes's example, it's hard to say. Um, And even if he had, uh, would his voice have carried the same weight as Holmes's? I think one reason to doubt that it would have is that Brandeis was largely viewed as an outsider. Um, He was the uh, first Jew to sit on the Supreme Court. And, uh, you know, he was uh, was incredibly wealthy and he, he was a part of the upper crust in Boston, but he was, because of his, um, uh, uh, the fact that he was Jewish, he was viewed as an outsider. Um, Holmes, on the other hand, uh, was the sort of ultimate insider. He was came from an old Boston Brahmin family. You know, his ancestors uh, went back to the 1600s um, in the United States. Uh, he fought in the Civil War. Um, you know, he was a, a good sort of rock-ribbed conservative. Um, and so when Holmes, um, you know, uh, raised his voice in defense of free speech, I think that that meant something. Mm-hmm. Um, and it carried more weight than it, than it would have had it come from someone like Brandeis. Yeah, I hate to end on a down note, but <laughs> one of the interesting stories in your story is how Judge Learned Hand and even Felix Frankfurter later changed their mind. Judge Learned Hand in Dennis v. United States, and you consider Judge Learned Hand perhaps was the person that led the charge, helped inspire Holmes to change his mind first in Dennis v. United States, which dealt with um, expression on behalf of members of the Communist Party or alleged members of the Communist Party. He sided with the government uh, in suppressing their speech. And he said that in each case, courts must ask whether the gravity of the evil discounted by its improbability justifies such invasion of free speech as necessary to avoid the danger. And in this case, 
he, he said it didn't. And in justifying that, he also rested on this idea of judicial restraint, which Holmes was initially the greatest champion of. Sure. Uh, and then Felix Frankfurter, once the case gets up to the Supreme Court, writes with the majority opinion in what you call an anguished, uh, using anguished language, um, asking the question, you know, how dangerous is the Communist Party? And he thought, pretty dangerous. So it's it's strange that you have Felix Frankfurter just, and Justice Judge Learned Hand, you know, the, the champions of free speech before Holmes, but later sort of turning back that that legacy, changing yeah. that legacy. Well, I, I, I do think that that is, um, it's a sort of odd twist in the story um, and, and you know, perhaps a, a discouraging one. I think that um, it really comes down to their belief in judicial restraint, uh, which grew uh, the longer they were on their respective courts. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hand went so far as to um, is to call into question the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education, mm-hmm. arguing that that was um, an example of uh, unwarranted um, judicial activism. Um, and so I think that their belief in judicial restraint became you know, nearly absolute um, in their later years, um, and that's why they were unwilling to use their uh, positions as judges um, to rule against the government in those cases. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, that they themselves were caught up in the hysteria of the mm-hmm. of the Red Scare or of McCarthyism. Hand made clear in letters that he wrote to friends that he was disgusted by the whole episode, mm-hmm. um, but he simply thought that he couldn't do anything about it, um, which is different than his view in 1917. Yeah, because um, I, I have to think he couldn't do more about it then than he could have done about the you know, prosecution of masses in 1917. Sure. And if you read that masses decision, he really wiggles his way around in, in arriving at his verdict. Absolutely. He was a smart judge. He could, yeah. have, he could, have, um, he could have made a good argument, and, and he could have simply applied the clear and present danger test instead of doing what he did, which was to largely um, gut it. Um, in his in his decision in, um, but he never agreed in, with Holmes on the clear and present danger test. He never did, and that may be why he later gutted it, thinking that it wasn't a good test. Um, he may have wanted to get rid of it, but you know it was better than than the alternative, which was really no test or to go back to bad tendency, um, which is um, in effect what he what he did in the Dennis case. Um, so I do think that that's a you know maybe that's a cautionary note here. Judicial restraint is is certainly um, uh, admirable um, in certain circumstances, but I think what Holmes did was he um, he articulated a theory about why judicial restraint should not be practiced quite as strictly in the context of free speech as in some other contexts. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating story, and it's one I hope all of our listeners will pick up. Professor Healy, thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much. That was Seton Hall Law Professor Thomas Healy, and his book, available wherever fine books are sold, is titled The Great Descent, How Oliver Wendell Holmes Changed His Mind and Changed the History of Free Speech in America. This podcast is hosted and produced and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my colleague, Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts. As I remind you every week, reviews help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, I hope you have a very great start to 2018. And thank you again for listening.